was still active. Michael Jordan, Vince Carter, Shaquille O'Neal, they're all like dunking in all different ima unimaginable and imaginable ways, whatever they can think of. They were doing that kind of stuff, and I wanted to dunk like they do. So I decided to pursue my dreams. So I decided to work hard for it. I started to work on leg exercises and uh, better and more eff efficient ways to jump. I didn't work on my core, probably that was my fault. <laughs> but uh, I tried to do all these different kinds of things to no avail. I had always two obstacles in my way. One, my height. I was not super tall, you know. Uh, you may think that I'm tall comparatively, perhaps, to yourself. But uh, for a basketball player, I'm pretty short. So it was pretty hard. And the other thing was gravity. Gravity was always pulling me down. And sometimes I'm very thankful for gravity. Like today, I'm not flying in the sky right now. But I, I, I decided to work hard and, and work pursuing this dream. And, uh, but there's always something pulling me down. I couldn't just dream like that song says, you know, I believe I can fly. <laughs> I believe. So I, I was that believer, but I couldn't really fly. The rim, the rim seems so tall, and I was so small. Gravity kept pulling me down. So there was a time when I actually finally came to grips with the fact that I would not dunk this basketball. And that day was actually a very freeing day for me. Because then I finally dawned on me, like, hey, three points are more than two. So I started shooting the three-pointer, and you know, I actually became quite satisfied and, and happy by being a, a decent three-point shooter. So anyway, why I share all this story about my basketball endeavors and my, my dreams that were broken by basketball is I share this because a lot of times our failures, the obstacles, the difficulties, Difficulties that so often we believe come in the way between us and our dreams. A lot of times, these circumstances, God uses to direct us in the direction of His dreams for us. God wants us to uh, do certain things, be a certain kind of, of persons in a way that uh, we are fully uh, unleashing our potential in the world but only when we pursue His dreams for us that we get there. In other words, our failures have the purpose of driving us to faith. So this morning, uh, we'll continue our series in the book of Galatians. We, we've been going through the book of Galatians, discussing, uh, you know, Paul writing this letter. That's why he wrote the letter of, uh, to the church of Galatia. To, because he was really concerned with them. He was concerned because they were starting to get a little confused about what the gospel really was, what, uh, you know, how a person came to faith in Christ. And the reason for that is that they were confused because there was some group of uh, religious leaders that moved from Jerusalem. They were probably doing their missionary journeys, right? They moved to Jer from Jerusalem into their area in Galatia there, and they were beginning to get them confused. They were telling them that uh, the faith that you placed in Jesus is not enough. You need more than just that. You need works. But these Galatians, they had been, uh, you know, they had placed their trust in Jesus. They had been walking by faith, but now they were getting a little confused. Is faith enough? They're probably asking. What else must I do to be saved? Do we also must keep the law of Moses in order to be saved? You know, in Paul's response and exhortation is this letter to the Galatians. And what Pastor Ed preached last week, you know, started, he's trying to do that, Paul's trying to do that, showed them that they started the Christian life by faith. And they now must continue it by faith. So today as we explore another section of this book, we'll touch in a key passage in the book. And that's Galatians 3, verses 15 through 22. 
And here we'll learn that while the law never had any power to save us, the law has a significant role to play in driving us to faith in Christ. So today is going to be a little bit different. Usually my messages are filled with stories. Today I don't have as many stories. However, I think there will be a lot of relevant and very important information that uh, it will be very good for all of us to be reminded of or learn for the first time. So, I didn't have time to put the PowerPoint in the back, but hopefully Pastor Bernard uh, did. Or not. <laughs> that means, that means, no, that's, that's, that's all right, that's all right. That just means that we're going to have to pick up a Bible. If you don't have one, we have in the back. Or if you have in your app, in, the, in, the, in your phone, uh, you're going to have to use that today. But let me just read to us verses 15 through 22. To give, to give a human example, brothers, even with a man-made covenant, no one knows it or adds to it once it, it has been ratified. Now, the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. It does not say, and to offsprings, referring to many, but referring to one. And to your, your offspring, who is Christ, this is what I mean. The law which comes 430 years afterwards does not annul a covenant previously ratified by God so as to make the promise void. For if the inheritance comes by the law, it no longer comes by promise. But God gave it to Abraham by a promise. Why then the law? It was added because of transgressions until the offspring should come to whom the promise had been made. And it was put in place through angels by an intermediary. Now, an intermediary implies more than one, but God is one. Is the law then contrary to the promises of God? Certainly not. For if a law had been given that could give life, then righteousness would indeed be by the law. But the scripture imprisoned everything under sin so that the promise of faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you so much for your promise. The promise that gives us life. We pray now that as we study a little bit the, the relationship between promise and law, we will learn and understand that there is a place for the law. In driving us to faith. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Okay, as Paul makes his argument, he uses a lot of information, as I alluded there before. He uses a lot of information that will cause my message to be a little bit different, but I believe it's important for us to, to take a look and, and a few things here. And the first thing I want to take a look at is this talk about these two guys. One of them is Abraham, and the other one is Moses. Basically, all that is written here is connecting the two, talking about the connection between the promise and the law given to each one of them. So early in the Bible, let's start with Abraham. Early in the Bible, God calls a man named Abraham. And to him, he gives give a promise. It's one of the first things that we see when God calls Abraham. And he says, you know, he calls him out of the land of Ur, where he was uh, living, and move, to move into uh, a, new, a new place, a, pro, a land that he would give Abraham. And he says this, I will make your, you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So this is a big promise God makes to Abraham. And this promise was ratified, in other words, made legit, you know, through a, by a promise in Genesis chapter 15. And he restated this by giving an illustration. You remember the, the story of uh, God asking Abraham to sacrifice his son Isaac? You know, some of you may, may know that. If not, you should read Genesis chapter 22. Uh, when you know we're done here and just be reminded uh, just think about that that as he's reminding him of the promise he had made to Abraham and then this promise is passed on to Isaac and then to Jacob and so on and so forth with all the descendants of Abraham 
Now, this promise, while certainly designed to uh, have an immediate application for the natural descendants of Abraham, the Jewish people, it was also designed to bless all the families of the earth, as we read in the promise, right? So there is a bigger uh, picture here with this promise. So this is Abraham's interaction with God first. Fast forward some 430 years, God called another man. And he is not explicitly mentioned here, but he is implied as the intermediary. It's Moses. This is the other man. He asked Moses to, you know, stop. he was shepherding sheep, and get out of there. I want to use you to confront Pharaoh and free my people from slavery in Egypt. So that's kind of Moses' role, right? So he goes to Egypt, confronts Pharaoh, and he's bringing the people out uh, from Egypt. And then after they, they leave Egypt, God says, you're going to, or it says before that, but he asks Moses as well to do another thing. To give his people his law. So Mo Moses goes up the mountain, meets with God. God gives him the law. Some 613 laws. And he gives to Moses. And Moses comes down. And he is supposed to bring that law to the people. Bottom line is this. Abraham, with Abraham, God interacted with a promise. By giving him a promise. And with Moses, by giving him the law. And the difference between promise and law are startling. They're huge. In promise, when God speaks to Abraham, when he's giving the promise, he says, I will, I will, I will, I will bless you. I will. When God is giving Moses the law, he says, you shall, you shall not. You shall, you shall not. So there's, there's a big difference in the language that he communicates these covenants. In promise, God reveals his plan. His plan for Abraham and mankind. He kind of like unveils, this is what I'm going to do for you. In the law, on the other hand, God shows the way of man, man's responsibility towards God. So this, these covenants are playing together. The promise is a gift. The law is rooted in works and effort. The promise uh, just had to be believed. You know, in, in uh, verse, chapter 15 of Genesis, we read that, uh, And Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. He didn't earn any righteousness. He didn't have to do to, to receive it. All he had to do was to believe God. And the law had to be obeyed. So there are huge differences between the two. Now one similarity that both had is that they had to be ratified. In me, and again, using that word, uh, it basically means being they, need, they had a ceremony around them. They had to be made legit in a way, right? Both of them had, had that aspect of them. And I think the closest way to illustrate that is to talk about, you know, Pastor Ed talked about a marriage, I think, last week, uh, a wedding ceremony. A wedding ceremony, I guess, would be a visual reminder for us today of what a covenant looks like. So I would like to ask the expert about uh, wedding covenants, right? So Pastor Ed is the expert. He, he has a married, how many people? Like some hundreds of people now? So he's more than that. He's, he's the expert. So let me just ask one simple question. Why do people choose to get married? Oh, lots of good reasons. Uh, Give me one. Um, the other person accepts them for who they really are. They don't have to pretend. Okay. So would you say that it's love? love. They love each other, right? Love. People that get married, they love each other. A... And they want to now make this love public. They want to make sure that people around know that they love each other. So they make covenants, right? They make vows in a wedding ceremony to express that. But another thing they do, and I know if the laws in Maryland or Virginia, or you know, I know you marry people on DMV, but uh, another thing that people usually do is sign a marriage license. 
And when you sign a marriage license, you have a witness. Whether you go to the courtroom or you go to the back room in a church, you know, uh, to write, you know, to sign the marriage license, there is that, uh, that's kind of like what ratifies this covenant, what makes it legit. I don't know if Maryland, they actually have signed the thing, but I think every, everywhere will be like that. But similar to the wedding ceremony, in both his covenants with Abraham and Moses, God has some ceremony involved in it. So let me just start with the Mosaic ceremony, which is the covenant with Moses, right? And I'm using all these words. I know it's, it's kind of like drinking from a fire hose today, but it's, it's, I, there's such depth and a lot of important information here that if we don't have a, a, an understanding or a background on it, Everything else that Paul is saying makes no sense. So the Mosaic ceremony. In his covenant with Moses, God asks Moses to gather all the people of Israel in one place so Moses can read the law to them. So that's what Moses does. When he comes down from the mountain, he, he gathers all the people, and now he's going to give the law that God gave him to the people. Right? And as soon as they read the whole law, the people say, We will keep this law. We will do everything that is in this law. And for those who know the story, what happened just a few moments later? They didn't keep the law, right? They built an idol and they started worshiping the idol because Moses was taking too long to come back from the mountain or something. So, uh, you know, they couldn't keep even for a minute that law. In the Abrahamic uh, ceremony, which the covenant with Abraham. God prepares a covenant ceremony in which animals are cut into, they're brought to Abraham. He tells Abraham, go bring some animals, cut them in two, and make an aisle with them. Because this was a, a, a way that people did covenants between two parties. And uh, we'll talk more about that later, but both parties entering the covenant were supposed to walk down then this, this aisle uh, as a sign of their commitment to the covenant. Now the interesting thing is this. In this covenant, when it came time for them to ratify it and walk down the aisle, which, you know, God waited. God waited until it was not dark, it was night, and Abraham fell asleep. So then God walks this covenant by himself. Moses, or Abraham, didn't, didn't, he was sleeping. He didn't have to, to do it. And in a way, God is, is doing this. In essence, he's saying, the promise I'm making you today, Abraham, this promise doesn't depend on you. It depends on me. I will keep my promise, whether you keep your side of the bargain or not. I'm making a commitment to my own self to bless you and all the peoples through you. Now, no wonder the Galatians were confused. Going back to our passage. No wonder, no wonder they were very confused. These two covenants are so different. But the same God gives them. He's the same God, but He gives two different covenants like that. Now, if we believe that God does everything with a perfect purpose, because He is the truth, uh, He is the way, He is the life, then both covenants must have their place in God's redemption plan. And they do. So, anticipating the fact that the Galatians would be a little confused, Paul uh, begins in verse 15 by saying, you know, even with a man-made covenant, no one annuls it or adds to it, once it has been ratified. So he, he goes on to explain a little bit more what was going on here. And here Paul is likely making a reference to, by the way, ancient Greek wills that could not be changed even if uh, the person was still alive. You know, they could not change a will. Uh, it would be always the same and could not be annulled by a new will. You could add a new promise in it, a new stipulation in it, but you could not change the previous ratified will. Anyway, in verses 17 and 18 then, Paul goes on to explain the Mosaic Covenant and the law, even though it was given, you know, comp compared with the Mosaic Covenant and the, and, and the law, that uh, even though it was, came 430 years later, it could not change the first one, 
The promise was still valid. Now, how then, it's probably the question that you were asking, how then, in verses, uh, you know, in the remaining of the, the, uh, this, this message, like, how then these two fit together? How the, the law and, and the promise, they fit together. And I think this is what Paul does in the remaining verses of this passage here. Verses 15 through 22. Paul explains it by discussing, and I'm going to just call it this, two ways the law can drive us to faith. I believe that he's, he's doing that in the, next, um, in the next few verses. And I, want, I would like to focus on that. Two ways the law can drive us to faith. And the first way the law drives us to faith is this. The law exposes our problem. Why then the law, in verse 19? It was added because of transgressions until the offspring should come to whom the promise that had been made. It was put in place through angels by an intermediary. Now, on, an intermediary implies more than one, but God is one. Why then the law? Because, you know, God asked this, uh, Paul asked this rhetorical question and he goes on to explain that it was added because of transgressions. In other words, the law was given to expose our sinful hearts. To expose what's inside of us. If you have ever received a speeding ticket, you have probably come to the realization that speed limit signs don't really cause you to not speed. When you see that sign, 65, the size 25, 35, they don't, they don't automatically stop you from speeding, right? They don't. In fact, they entice you to, to, to go over it. Oh, I can go 10 over, you know, I can go 10 over. So speed limit signs are the law, but guess what? They do not make you obey the law. They don't. All they do is tell you when, how, and where you broke the law. And then you, you receive a nice letter in the mail with a picture that shows. You know, I have a few of those. But uh, all they do is tell you when, how, and where you broke the law. They remind you that you fell short, you crossed the line, you failed to meet the standard. That's all they can do. With that said, the law has never been the problem nor the solution for our problems. The law simply reveals to us that we have a problem. That's all it does. It reveals that we have a problem. And it's so easy to downplay the attitudes and the actions, the attitudes of our heart and the actions of our hands. And the law played an important role in exposing just that. And if the law is God's way to pierce my heart and expose the darkness that is inside of me, how much I need that law. Now, I fear in, in our current day and age that we have forgotten how much our acceptable sins grieve the heart of God. Now, there's so many things that we, we feel like just, ah, this is no big deal, I can do that. But Jesus had to die for that. So it's just grievous that we just downplay sin altogether. So the law exposes our sinful hearts to bring us to the point of hopelessness. And I know we use that word hopelessness in a very negative way nowadays, and we, which, uh, granted, it is. You know, feeling hopeless is, is awful. But there is a positive side in feeling hopeless as well. When we feel hopeless about our ability to earn God's favor, when we, we get to the point that, oh, man, I can't do this. I'm just too bad. I can't reach to the clouds and be holy. I can't do it. Then when we get to the point of hopelessness, then we can begin starting to look outside of ourselves for a solution. Because we cannot bring holiness upon us. It has to be uh, given to us by the Holy One. 
So earning our righteousness was never the law's purpose. Jesus' purpose was to do that. So the law drives us to faith by exposing our problem. But also, the law points us to the promise. In verses 21 through 22, as Paul wraps up, uh, wraps up his uh, explanation on how the promise and law completed uh, each other, he writes, Is the law then contrary to the promises of God? Certainly not. For if a law had been given that could give life, then righteousness would indeed be by the law. But the scripture imprisoned everything under sin so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. Is the law then contrary to the promises of God? Well, no way. Paul is saying, no way. These covenants are not contrary to each other. They complement each other. When the sinfulness inside of us is exposed, again, we are then able to look outside of ourselves for a solution. And we have to have the promise then. When we are looking for, our, you know, inside of us, we need to have the promise. If we don't have the promise, we have no hope. We have no ability to be, be healed and be fixed and be restored. There's no way to do it. So when we accept that, that we are not self-sufficient beings, that's when we can begin uh, the process of restoration and be uh, made perfect, made new. Faith in Jesus Christ is driven by our ability to see who we really are. So the law can drive us to faith. But it will, it will do it only as we allow it and I'm going to conclude here with this but you know you see there, there are two great problems that often keep us from driving to faith two great problems one we downplay the significance of sin I think I mentioned and alluded that to that a little bit in the beginning but we have come to the point where many of us created this world where we rationalize everything that we're doing wrong. We just don't see it anymore. We created this, this bubble where we, you know, sin is acceptable. You know, oh, loving God with all my heart, uh, so in mind, well, well, that doesn't imply, it doesn't include that I, you know, have to uh, give my talents to the community of faith, perhaps, that I'm gathering in. Or, oh, no, loving, loving my neighbor as myself doesn't include, you know, Jenny, that, that kind of, was rude to me last week and now if you're Jenny here sorry I didn't mean to uh, she was rude to me last week and you know I don't have to forgive her or try to talk to her I mean there, there's no reason for that you know it didn't really mean it's, it's my next door neighbor or like you know but you kind of create your own neighborhood you know in your head oh it's my co-workers that's my neighbors uh, you know you kind of play with that or you know you don't really have to share the truth when you make a mistake at work, you know, like how it happens, sometimes you make a mistake and, well, if I don't tell anybody, nobody's going to know. Uh, and, and then something bad happens down the road. But anyway, these are all white lies and, and simple things that a lot of times we downplay. But as I said before, Jesus had to die even for the white lies. He had to die for, for the most insignificant in our minds sins. So it's a very serious thing, but a lot of people think that breaking the law is a non-issue. Right and wrong is relative. Now if that is you, let the law expose your sin and drive you to faith. Because the reality is this, we can't and will never be able to measure up. You know, I, I, came, I came in today with my, my Jordans, just to illustrate my point, right? Yeah, and, uh, and I, I know they look a lot bigger than what they really are because I'm wearing skinny jeans. <laughs> but, uh, you know, we are not designed to dunk the basketball. I mean, some of us might be. But in my case, uh, I wasn't designed to do it. That was not my goal. That was not my purpose. And God made us in, <laughs> made us in such a way that we were not designed to earn our favor with him 
It was given. In Romans chapter 3, verse 23, a very known verse, might be new for some of you, but uh, we, we have been uh, given this truth that we will have, uh, all of us have, have sinned and come short of the glory of God. It's, it's very uh, disappointing in a way for, for a lot of us, but it's the truth. And we need to get to the point where we stop fooling ourselves and run to Jesus. He's the only one that can heal us from our self-righteousness. And the other problem keeping us from driving to faith is this. We downplay the significance of God's forgiveness. Oh God, God can never forgive me. He will never forgive me for what I've done. And we downplay the role of God's forgiveness towards us. And if that is you this morning, know this. While we were yet sinners, God or Jesus Christ died for us. While we were yet sinners. You didn't have to clean up, get your act together. While we were sinners, He died for us. Now remember that ceremony, the Abrahamic ceremony where they did, you know, at God asked Abraham to do this kind of gory thing of cutting the animals in half, putting in an aisle, and having the parties walk through it, you know. If you can remember that covenant, there's a special thing about that ceremony. Which, by the way, uh, you know, walking by these animals, when they, wa they would walk by these animals, they, they were pretty much stating to each other this. May it happen to me what happened to these animals. So the, as they were walking these covenants to, to solidify, to show their commitment towards the covenant, they would be saying that. May it happen to me what happened to these animals. And guess what? Because God was the only one walking this, this aisle. He was taking on the responsibility for both parties. If I don't keep the promise, Abraham, I will May it be to me like these animals. But if you don't keep the promise, Abraham, and your descendants, may it be to me as to these animals. And guess what? Fast forward years later, Jesus Christ walked the hill willingly and gave his own life and was broken for us. And he did that because of our inability to earn for ourselves. In Jesus Christ's sacrifice, you know, if you're that person that you, you're wrestling, you know, forgiveness, I don't deserve forgiveness. Well, Jesus Christ paid on that cross for your past, present, and future sins. Because you will not be perfect. <laughs> you know, there, there is the presence of sin in our world. And we are very influenced by it. We have been used. It's been a habit for us. So you will not be perfect right away. But God will, will, will give you His perfection. So when He looks at you, He looks now at Jesus because He take, took our place um, on the cross, lifting our burden. So cease working to earn God's forgiveness. Accept it. Accept this free gift of God by faith and live. Now let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you.